It's real. It's real. You know the deal. You know the deal. Hey, it's Shante. And I'm Natalie. And welcome to What's the Deal, a podcast powered by the Norfus Firm. At the Norfus Firm, we solve people problems. We have the pleasure of working with employers all around the world on HR and diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Well, hey. Hey. <laughs> We're back. And you know what? We're really up in our game because we have another professor as a guest today. I had to say we get really high quality guests. On high, show. like really top high notch. value. Yeah. And so <laughs> this, this though, entering the academia space is yeah. important because it informs so much of Right. Like we take it from the academic to the practical. But I think if you don't understand the academic, it's really hard to get to the practical. Right. right. So who do we have today? Well, everyone, for your pleasure, we are with Professor Tiffany Atkins. Hi, Tiffany. Uh, Hi. I'm very ahead. Uh, We're doing great. We're doing great. I'm going to do a quick intro of you. And I took notes because, again, I like to make sure I use the words that people use themselves well she out tried to also outdo so, me because she has more words on her cards than me but that's that's don't okay don't hate on my word game <laughs> such a hater i'm just kidding anyway so this Actually, is such a us. lover <laughs> you yes, know that you one are. of your biggest yes, supporters you are. yes you are okay anyway Professor Tiffany Atkins is a dynamic speaker and visionary, uh, a visionary educator who enjoys teaching, coaching, and working with others around their equity and inclusion goals. And so Tiffany has close to a combined, I believe, 20 years, both in like legal world work, like as a lawyer, and then also as a professor at Wake Forest Law School and Elon University Law School. And so as a scholar, Tiffany focuses on um law and culture and systems and how they impact people of color, particularly black people, and then also people of color and how those, those systems impact their ability to live freely and exist in the world. And so that is like the work. And then I think recently, Tiffany, you've also uh, really focused on how uh, different generations interact in the workplace. So just even evolving Mm -hmm. your, your equity work into really focusing on that. And so I think the conversation that we're having today not I think, I know the conversation we're having today is really focusing on that. Like how do these generations play nice together, so to speak, um, and really highlighting the values and experiences of each generation and how we can leverage that to do really great DEI work in various organizations. So to kick us off, I guess, can we, let's start there. Like, what do you, what have you seen in terms of how generations interact in the workplace? What are some of the, the, the big takeaways that folks listening to the podcast should be mindful of? Yeah. Well, thanks for that intro and thanks for having me. Um, You're right. In the past few years, my work on equity and inclusion really has included intergenerational conversations because in the workforce, we're seeing younger people who we assume and how we may experience them being more equity minded. They're coming into workplaces that have concrete systems that have existed for decades. Many of these places, their systems have existed before the young people were even born. And so we're seeing conflicts and clashes as they come in. And my work really has been to inform spaces. How can spaces be more prepared for these young people who are coming in? How to design, you know, doing some backward design work. How can they design spaces to be more inclusive? So what I've seen in that is a couple of things. Like I've talked about these existing systems. You know, people who created these systems are very beholden to them and they often take it very personally. It becomes a personal personal attack against my baby, my creation, when a young person kind of comes in with fresh ideas. But what I try to encourage people is to really think of it as freshness, right? It's not necessarily that someone is there to tear down, right? We're not Cersei, we're not Danny trying to break the wheel and burn the whole system, my Game of Thrones references. We're not here to do that, but they are here to offer some freshness. And I think that there is tremendous opportunity if they can live in that space of like revitalization and being open to different perspectives. I think that's where organizations who want to take it to the next level of being inclusive and equity minded, particularly with generations, can thrive. If you can tap into this freshness of young people and sort of reimagine your existing systems, and I think you'll see tremendous growth. And I think they'll find it rewarding to work with young people instead of a chore or a task or exhausting. There's really a lot of freshness, I think, in that experience. Yeah, that the revitalization piece is, is is key in these systems and how do you really break this open so that everyone can show up and, and do really great work. Um, as we were preparing for this episode, you were speaking about um, just how to relate to the different generations from 
each generation relating to the other. And I thought it was an interesting point that you were making in terms of, of older generations, um, this level of, of not wanting to like, I guess, move on, so to speak. Well, because of the lack of trust. Yeah. yeah. That piece was important. You noted mm-hmm. that some, uh, some senior leaders don't have to work anymore, but they haven't yeah. left because they don't trust the younger generation to do the job the way they would, which was like, mm-hmm. whoa. So if we think about it from that perspective, what, what are you seeing there in terms of what's giving you the indication that there's yeah. trust issues other than if people are outright saying they don't trust? Yeah. Well, I think if we look at the power dynamics, most organizations, and I'm including academic, like law schools, colleges, most of the leaders, they have earned those spaces, right? They have, they were top of their game, top of their field when they were older, when they were younger, they've built prestige, they've built reputation, they've built these companies, they've earned their spots, but they've earned those spots doing the work that was valued at the time. For them, that was 80 hour work weeks, 90 hour work weeks. That was putting all the domestic responsibilities on one spouse so that you could climb that ladder. It was putting family aside so that you could work, work, work to make strides. And for that generation, we're thinking about boomers and older, they had to work in that way. Your goal was to get a good government job and you stayed in that job. That loyalty and commitment was rewarded by Um, promotion and more money and leadership. And so when they are viewing younger people who aren't beholden to those systems, right? And so the critique of millennials, so I I am an Xennial, sort of that little micro group between millennials and Xers, uh, but millennials were often denigrated because they said, older people said, they don't have commitment, they're flighty. They go from one job to the next. Well, when you look at who's in leadership, who's doing the hiring, who's doing the promoting, Often they are using their internal rubric. This is how I was promoted. So I'm going to evaluate your success and your value based on how I was myself evaluated. So then there's a little bit of a shift, right? We don't see them meeting. um, There's no meeting of the minds, I guess, there. And so it does lead to distrust. This millennial worker isn't going to stay. They're not going to work as hard as I worked. If I teach them the ropes, they're going to leave. And then I'm going to have to teach someone else. So around this concept of trust, right? Like I did it a certain way. Look where it got me. I'm going to talk to you to see if you can do it the way I did it. Um, it actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, we, we were chatting and we were like, ah, oh, trust, right. Makes sense. Like when you're thinking about it is, if, if I don't trust you to do the job, I'm not going to let go. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I think about that from being like a law firm associate. Right. I worked at a large law firm. These partners have really big clients. There's big stakes for them. Maybe the stakes for them are not the same stakes for me, which is why they're like, uh, you can't do anything until we know you can do it. You're going to just write these papers, write these memos and do this research until we think you can do it. But the reality is, is that it's not very practical in this day and age. Right. And Mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you talk to people about on sort of overcoming this? This is how I do it or this is how I got there. What are some of the things that you encourage people to think about? Yeah, I think one of the things is that I try to always remind folks to have really good intentions, assume good intentions. So that's on both sides. So even with the managers and the leaders who are um, in t- applying this sort of internal rubric and judging people according to standards that are often often aren't really realistic for this perspective anymore is to one, assume that the person coming in has the ba- the minimum characteristics that you had when you took the job, right? And so don't assume that they're going to come in at your level. Assume that they're going to come in eager and excited to do the work. And with these sort of generational stereotypes about millennials and even boomers and Gen Zers, all the stereotypes assume that the person that is hired, if you have done a good job of training the folks who do the hiring, assume that they have the ability to do the work and that you as a mentor and a leader have the opportunity to shape the relationship. And so often it's a shift away from the managerial leadership style to a mentoring coaching style. And that requires some um, introspection, right, to realize that the younger people might need something different. They might require a different leadership style. And that's hard for some older people. But I also think that 
that I try to assume good intent also of the leaders, right? And so I often encourage them to do some backward design work. What is it you really want these young people to feel about the work that they do for you, to feel about the organization they're in? I assume you want them to feel good about their work. And if so, how do you design your systems and your processes to give them a good feeling about the place where they're working, to help them feel invested? Then you don't have to worry about them leaving if you've designed a space in such a way where they can thrive. And so it really does take some intentional backward design work um, and introspection on what is it you want people to think and feel about your organization? Why would they want to stay? I, I love how you're framing it from the leader's perspective and what they need to do in order to create the environment people want to stay, right? That's that's pretty much, that's why we have this podcast is to talk about that perspective. Yeah. But as you're talking, I'm, I'm listening and I'm like, but, but this intergenerational thing is a two-way street, right? And so if you're looking at it from the person who's in Gen Z, who's the millennial, people always, you know, they play Gen X. No one ever mentions Gen X anymore, but as a proud member of Gen X, <laughs> you know, Gen X, you know, who's really up next, um, yeah. you know, like yeah. what do we, what do we need to be doing to, um, maybe lead like uh, uh what does it manage up so to speak and just really how do we also work to create these systems that are a little bit better for whatever the next generation is even after gen z whatever that is um yeah. i don't know but you know what, is, how, what does that look like you know for for others yeah. to kind of contribute to that to the, the revitalization of the systems as we started the conversation with yeah i love how you asked that question because it is a two-way street right we we put some onus on the leadership because they come in and they set the tone for the organization certainly right, right. but also for young people coming in i think it's important that they also come into it with the right frame of mind so certainly we ex Often when we think about intergenerational, we think clash, right? You've got this young person, they're going to clash with the older person. But from a young person's perspective, I think if they go into it expecting and wanting a mentor, then I think that there is some value there. What can I learn from this person? Instead of sort of coming in thinking about how I must push them out to thrive, I think some of the most rewarding relationships I've had have been with older people who see me and say, Tiffany, I see something there, and then I allow myself to be taught by them. So I think it's also a manner of being teachable and coachable. Um, now, certainly when we're talking about sort of DEI work, there that relationship might change a little bit, right? Because I think young people might be able to teach older people more. And I'm not going to generalize here, but I think that there might be some perspectives where younger people might be able to take a little bit of a different approach. But I think that remaining teachable and then young people also need not participate in age discrimination. Don't assume coming in in, that these older people are outdated, right? We talk about OK Boomer, we remember that trend from Twitter, um, but I think that also creates some dissonance in the relationship. So I think it's a matter of good intent on both sides. I'm coming in expecting uh, or desiring to be coached. Older people, you should onboard young people and create systems where they can be coached, where they can be mentored and groomed, and then where you can begin to trust them to assume leadership. I think every older person needs to hire a younger person and expect them to become a leader and treat them as though they are the next leader of the organization and not just someone doing the grunt work. You know, in our DEI surveys that we um, give out, you know, that we administer to uh, large groups of employees, the desire for mentorship is like at an all time high. Mm -hmm. And the desire for clarity and career path, which I think is also an intergenerational mm -hmm. issue where, and I think this gets at like, when you're just trying to be open to, we can get here a lot of different ways, but we were sort of raised, just work really hard and something good will happen. People these days are coming into work is how, like, what are the, actually the things I need to do? And in ways that are just like, they, they are, they don't let up, which I, I believe takes a lot of courage and I admire. And there's parts of me that wish mm -hmm. I was better at that when I was, you know, younger, where it was like, I just accepted that if I went and I worked all these hours, eventually something good would happen and they don't want to put their life up to chance. And I think that's one of the things that we continue to see as an outcome of the pandemic is people have really reevaluated, reevaluated what's important to them, which is why also I often am checking people when they're like, oh, these young people don't want to work. And I need, I'm like, neither do older people because we are seeing, we, we see it 
at all ages. Mm-hmm. People are like, I don't want to only work. I don't want to only uh, or disregard my family or have all these things. Like, I want to live differently. And I think for those yeah. who are at the yeah. very top, they struggle to understand that. Why wouldn't you want this? And we talked about that with that whole quiet quitting phenomena of right. like, because like I, we don't all have to want to be a CEO or, or, and we see it. I mean, these people give up their lives for these companies and that's their choice, right? It's not a criticism, but you can see some of the, like it, it creates some level of being out of touch, right? Because it's sort of like, they see it from this like grind and look where it's gotten me and you, why aren't you grinding? And it's like, first of all, you, your money situation is like way, way different than mine. Oh, so yeah. for some people, it's like, that seems really far away. And it's like this, this cost benefit of analysis, like, do I really want to have to try to put in to get, and I just saw this quote, which I think I sent to you, or this chart, where boomers um, take up half of the share of the $140 trillion that's at stake in this com- uh, country. So I think there's also just a, a being out of touch with yeah. the fact that you have you all have the money, the money and the power. Yeah. So it's like for those who don't have the money and the power, they're not seeing it in in the way of like why would I want to do that? What's also interesting is that from a Gen Z perspective, they have seen what you talked about this American dream that if I work hard, I'll make all this money. They saw that fail, right? So during the Great Recession, they saw their hardworking parents lose it all. People who had worked yeah. 80 hour weeks go from having a fat bank account to being in a foreclosure. And so for them, that American dream does not exist. What the data also shows is that younger people are moving away from, so when we look in the higher ed space, they're moving away from from majors like philosophy, but I was a philosophy pre-major, right? They're moving away from these uh, philosophical sort of majors. They want concrete. They want something where show me a pattern or practice where I know day one, I will have skills that will make me money. And they can't be faulted for that because again, their experience has been the great recession. Then they saw Donald Trump, but they've just seen a lot of things happen that causes a little bit of distrust with how older people saw the world. World, which is work hard, pay your taxes, you'll do fine, right? Young people are like, well, my mama worked hard and she lost everything, so I'm going to work smart. It's not hard, it's smart. And that could be becoming an influencer. When I go to law schools and I say, you know, you're creating law schools and trying to force students into these law schools, those students know they can go on TikTok and make a million dollars. They don't have to come to our schools. So why are we trying to force them into a mold that doesn't exist? They will go and make five million on TikTok and do their lives the way they want. So there's a there's a, a space for understanding of like the world that the boomers grew up in doesn't really exist and they can't be faulted for that, but nor can Gen Z. We really have to have space for everyone's experience and opportunities to see where we can learn from each other and push the organization forward. And and to that point, you made a comment about um, earlier about how people stayed at jobs like, and, and so that, and now they get upset, which we see with, oh, they were only at this job for this period of time. And, and I think that what we're seeing is it's actually to your detriment at times if you stay at the same company for 20 and 30 years, mm-hmm. right? Like we're seeing folks who are so stuck They're and you're stuck. like, They're and they, I, I keep using the example from, I don't know if you've seen Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, but it's like, I call it the bunker example where the way that show it goes is the, the main character, Kimmy Schmidt and other women were like kidnapped by some guy who put them in a bunker and told them that the world ended be, around them and they're operating mm-hmm. in this bunker in the way and then like, the light opens and someone finds them and it's like, Oh my God, there's a whole world out there. Sometimes I feel like we have clients that are like in the bunker where like, they're just, they're used to what they were used to in that. And it's like leaving and going to other companies can be super valuable because you're picking up kinds of the trends and traits and things that happen. It also can demonstrate someone who um, is decisive, right? Like this one is not working. This position's not working for me. So I'm going to find something that does. And in the end, we shouldn't be wanting to treat our employees like chattel, Mm -hmm. right? We should Mm -hmm. want them to grow and have fulsome careers, even if that's not with us. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you get past that? Like that, that, that notion of, you know, is it, is it envy? Is that what's there as well? Where it's like, they can jump and move in certain ways that maybe I 
either didn't allow myself to or couldn't because of whatever circumstance or again, maybe it's generational. What is at the root of that where it's like you, you fault someone for being able to make the moves or speak up on things yeah. or do things in a certain way. And then because of that, now you, you're like shutting them down. What is, what's that? What's the deal? You know, it's so interesting because this conversation happens in so many different arenas. It happens in education, you know, with, with faculty members who come and go. And then it's, and I think it again, if we're thinking about generations, uh, you know, boomers, when they got a good job for them, they were trying for stability. For them, stability looks like I need to have a job. I go to the same job. I take the same route to work. It's consistency, it's stability. Maybe it's a con, you know, a result of the Great Depression, how they had to manage and survive. And for them, that made that was workable for them. And we should applaud that. Like that's what it took for you to survive and support your family. That's wonderful. But it doesn't mean that that's how young people have to survive. We're not out for survival. Survival, right? This should be about young people where they should thrive. And I think that, you know, I don't know if it's jealousy, but I think there's a little bit. And honestly, I see this a lot with young women and older women, right? I see this friction happen so much so with women who, um, you know, sometimes older women feel as though they had to stay in a position for a certain amount of time because they had to pay their dues. They had to do what it takes to survive. And so there's a little bit of that with younger women who come in and they're vocal and they are talking against inequalities and things they're seeing. And then there's a little bit of weight. How dare you come in and talk to us that way? And then a little bit, it might be, man, I wish I had had that power to do what she's doing. So I think there's a little bit of it. What I think is powerful about young people's ability to move is it takes tremendous courage and creativity to name the constellation of your stars, right? If I can take some skills from one place to a next, right? If I've had three jobs in five years, that means I'm tremendously creative in telling my story, right? What have I learned over these three to five years? What's the naming of my constellation? I'm not a one, two, or three. I'm a four. I'm all these things together. And if organizations think of it that way, what other creative energy can that person bring to our organization? How can and they help us even in the short term. And what I think would be valuable for organizations is instead of creating a five-year plan for an employee, what's their two-year plan? right? Give them their review. Here's what I think you could do in the next two years to maximize your leadership, to give some value to the organization and to develop. Then if they stay after that two years, great. Here's your next plan so that there's no punishment, right? I've given to you, I've received from you. If we go our separate ways in two years, great or not. Uh, so I think that that's a paradigm shift. We're not doing a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan for a manager. We're training leaders. And whether they give us that for two or five years, I think that there's value and then maybe creating an intentional plan with that in mind would be smart. Uh, that's, I love the, like, this is the reality of it. Stop saying, well, why aren't yeah. they? And why can't they? And why, you know, this, they're not guys, they're not staying with right. these companies long right. term. So you need to adapt. What right. I love the idea of, okay, no, let's look at a two year leadership plan. Absolutely. Get you to a certain point as opposed to, okay, no, by year five, this person's not going to be here at year five or not. And, and the reality is, is that like, it, it's like, it takes it into bite sized pieces. Mm -hmm. I think that where, where we, again, I, I would overlay the, the, the damage to our collective psyche from the pandemic to all of this, where mm -hmm. people don't have the same levels of attention generally. Like I speak about the fact that like pre pandemic, I'd be into a lot of Netflix shows and the like. And now it's like, it's really difficult for me to watch a full episode of something. Cause I got so used to the micro content on social media yeah. and that type of thing. And I, like for whatever reason, they just don't have it. And so it's like recognizing too, like, you know, your audience doesn't have the band five band. years to, they're not thinking that far ahead. And this actually mm -hmm. brings up some conversations we had with some, you know, young black lawyers who were really pushing on like, well, what is the path to partnership? And yeah. it's an age old question, but it's like, now it's like, no, you guys have to be really clear about it. And I remember thinking like, well, what is the average tenure that people have at jobs? And at the time when I had the question, it was like 3.89 years, but now it's, now it's like two and a half years is the average tenure. Mm -hmm. And if you contrast that to at most law firms, it's at least eight years, but more like 10 to 12 years before you're even considered for partner. What are you offering those yeah. people 
to get them to stay five to six times longer than the national average of when people, how long people stay at jobs and talking mm-hmm. to like more senior leaders in the firm, they're like, Oh, who wouldn't want to be a partner? But it's like, what does it even mean to be a partner? Like, I, you yeah. know what I mean? I'm, I'm 20 years out and still like, well, what exactly is a partner? I mean, I'm being a little facetious because I, I, I better understand that now, but I didn't have that value proposition, which is why I didn't put the effort in to become a partner. And I did something I didn't understand, like, why I'd want to do that. And that was staying in law firms for almost 10 years. Right. Like I could have I was yeah. right there. I could have actually I was asked when I wanted to be put up for a partner, but I didn't know what I was being put up for. And so I think this idea yeah. of these bite sized pieces, these shorter plans gives people the ability to say, okay, well, I see, I know I'm working towards something and then maybe they actually will stay longer than you think because you've invested in them. But this assumption that they're going to come in. And and I think the second piece of this is, which we've talked about with clients who have a lot of long-term employees is they earned your loyalty. You haven't earned the person's loyalty on day one. I mean, it's like the thing of you think highly of this place and people should feel how you feel is like because they poured into you for 10 or 15 years. Yeah. And, and the trust piece comes into that, too, because it's like you've invested in them. You've shown them that they have a that longevity here if they want it. From what these kids have seen, again, going kids, these are grown people, some of them. Um, to, to Tiffany's point is that, no, they've seen this thing totally fall down. Right. So they're walking in just like, I don't, how long is this actually going to last? Let me just get in, do what I got to do and then be out. So. And stability. Can you talk a little bit, Tiffany? I'm sorry. Can you, can you talk talk a little bit too, to this piece of stability? Like the, that this idea of I've seen stuff crash. So stability for, Mm -hmm. for younger generations looks different than it might be for a boomer who stays somewhere for 30 years. Yeah, for sure. So for them, it's more about, I know the world is an unsafe place. And this goes to so many different levels. It's not just financial safety, but their bodily safety. So I think this impacts how long they're willing to stay anywhere. They know that they could, sadly, something could get shot up, right? Their school, their job, they could be hit by. I mean, there's so many statistics. So many young people don't get licenses anymore. You know, it's staggering how many young people, when I was 15 in DC, like, I mean, as soon as I was of age, I got my learner's permit and I was driving. But the vast majority, of young people aren't getting their licenses because they are afraid of driving. They're afraid of something dangerous happening because the world is a dangerous place. So I think that stability for them, they don't necessarily know that they want to or that they will be in any place for five years. So stability for them is, is my life fulfilling? Am I making a difference for others? So Gen Z is largely motivated by one, their number one motivator is making a difference for others. And they're not motivated by things like competition. So in the law school space, when I talk to schools about why are we still curving grades? You know, like the students are not motivated by, I need to have the number one. They don't have that scarcity mindset, right? They talk more openly about grades. Well, I got an A, why can't she get an A, right? So there's lack, very little scarcity mindedness. They know that there are some other things we can all share. So I think that they don't believe in the stability of the American dream or that everything is safe. If I just do good, good things will happen. It's sort of a give me concrete steps so that I can make a difference today because tomorrow's not promised. So I think that there is this this attitude with most things. Um, And then in the workplace, I love what you said at that point you made about loyalty, uh, because for people who really want Gen Zers to stay, the way I think they can do that is one, investing in the work that the student or the worker is doing, and then two, giving them the opportunity to make a difference for others. So the brass ring isn't partner necessarily if you're a lawyer, right? It's uh, what kinds of organizations or what kind of charity work can you do? What are you in charge of? What's the work you are in charge of for our organization? How can you help our firm make a difference for others? How can you assume leadership? How can you have an active role in the work that we do outside of the firm? I think that connection of investing in me while I invest in others is how we can keep Gen Zers motivated and even interested in leadership roles. Otherwise, I think that this idea like stability is just for them. It doesn't it doesn't come from me being in a seat every day. Yeah. Gosh, we love good conversation. Wow. And I really hate to tell yeah. you all that it's time <laughs> to wrap. So if we think about what we talked about today and what are some of the key takeaways, first and foremost, two way street. 
we will put, if we were going to put this on a scale, we would probably tip it slightly in the, in the favor of a leader having a little bit more work to do here because we know tone from the top and leaders set the culture and set the tone and all of that. So number one, though, we are not just saying to you leaders is all on you. Mm -hmm. We are also saying that workers, especially younger generation, recognize that there's an opportunity to learn from those who became came before you. And I very much believe that that many Gen Zers and others want to want to do that. I think number two it takes intentionality, which we say over and over and over. Um, it's not a five year plan. It's a two year plan. It's not an expectation that someone has to be here 30 years to be to reach some level of success and success is going to look different for for everybody. And it's also, I think, this last piece of recognizing that stability means something different for different people, which I think is a huge, huge point towards keeping an open mind and being thoughtful, like we talk a lot of other people's perspectives. I think when I think about the timeline that Tiffany shared in terms of what Gen Zers experienced with a lot of layoffs and such of their parents, it was like a click for me. It's like, yeah, like, why would you trust that if you put everything into this place, they're going to, it's going to pan out. So recognizing that stability for you is not the same as stability for someone else. Thank you, Tiffany. We Thank you. appreciate you. I'm sorry, Professor Adkins. I've known Tiffany for a really, really long time, but I love this professor title. So let me let me honor that. But thank you so much for your time. Um, and for everyone else, stay tuned. We'll be back. Bye. Here it is. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and leadership. That's the deal when you know what you're dealing with. Learn how to